Welcome to St. John and the Beloved Disciple Parish's presentation of Sunday Mass Warm-Up. We offer this presentation hoping we can provide insights to enrich your participation in the upcoming weekend Masses at the Church of your choice. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you will renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. O oh God, on the first Pentecost, you instructed those who believe in you by the light of the Holy Spirit. Under the inspiration of the same spirit, give us a taste for what is right and true, and a continuing sense of his presence and power. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Tonight's presenters are myself, Steve Solentrup, Rich Horst, Kathleen Horst, Bobby Rich. This Sunday's Mass is the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. The scripture readings for this Mass are the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 45, verses 1 and 4 to 6. The first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5 and the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 to 21. To you I call, for you will surely heed me, O God. Turn your ear to me, hear my words. Guard me as the apple of your eye, and the shadow of your wings protect me. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the tax, census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The word of the Lord. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Few weeks we've had these parables from Jesus and even last week's the parable right before this one in, in the gospel and the theme a lot of times has been hypocrites and we have that again this week as well but in this time we have not only the Pharisees the chief priests the scribes we also have the Herodians uh, those reporting this for lack of a better term the civil government at the time and I think part of that implies that when we get to the bottom of the, the reading, he says, give back to what is Caesar, Caesar's, but what belongs to God, to God. It somewhat kind of implies that you can have, you have to pay attention to, to a certain extent to the civil government verse, but in the end, God's law is what prevails. And that you always have to have a pure conscience and doing what is right before the Lord. Um, some of the things you think about in, in civil government sometimes is that they're there for the common good of the people. Um, they, you know, are there to provide laws, theoretically to also help the downtrodden, 
uh, those lower in society, those types of things. And I think part of how this relates to us in today's world is just that. We have to, to live in a civil government society. However, we cannot let that law go above God's law, divine law. That in the end, we have to have the pure conscience to be able to answer to God, not to be hypocrites, but to do what's right. And I, I think that's kind of one of the things I see with reading. And it kind of struck me today as I was driving home, they are talking on the uh, radio about the beginning of the confirmation uh, for the Supreme Court Justice. Again, here's something that's civil law, but at least in this instance, I hope, uh, the candidate also abides by God's law. And I think she'll probably be vilified for that for a lot of reasons as it goes through the process. But I think it kind of speaks to me, at least in today's environment, is that we always have to remember that, that we have to be civil, we have to have some level of government, but God's law is the overarching thing that we have to uh, respond to. Yeah, as, as you pointed out, the, the Pharisees, they're always uh, plotting against Jesus. You we see it many times in the Bible, and I notice that uh, you know, Jesus is calling them out as, as the hypocrites they are. I mean, they, they're always trying to show their superiority, you know, and they're, uh, they're, they're so much higher and mighty and uh, above everyone else. But uh, Jesus calls them out, so there's, there's no wonder that in, in some respects that they're after him because uh, he, he just doesn't put up with it. You know, and the other thing that struck me was they sent their disciples and the Herodians. It, it was like, uh, you know, they sent somebody else to do their dirty work. They didn't have the guts to go themselves, the, the top leaders, the Pharisees and such. So so that uh, caught me as kind of uh, uh, oh, hypocritical and, and on, their, on their part. Um, I, I agree with both of you. And, <laughs> um, but I also, you know, think that, he, you know, it is our moral duty. I think he's trying to say, hey, no matter what we do, you know, you are responsible for your actions. So you need to, know, I mean, you know what the difference between right and wrong is. So, you know, as they're trying, as you said, you know, they're always trying to trip up, you know, Jesus. and But he's always one step ahead. So, um, I, you know, he just wants to make sure that um, that we need to make sure that we do, that we're honest and, you know, live according to God's will. You know, we do have to have structure, especially in today's world, you need to have structure. But. Do you, you find it kind of fascinating that uh, when they ask, when Jesus asks for the coin, uh, those people have it, even though the Jews were not supposed to have it, it was kind of a sign of heresy, but they produce it right away. Jesus had no coins. Kind of like when he went out and talked to the, sent out the disciples, he told them, you know, take no money, take no anything else except the sandals on your feet and, and the cloak that you're wearing. So it was just kind of funny to me, I thought that, you know, he asked them for that because he never had one. He never used it. He never needed it. All they needed was the words he was given. Yeah. yeah. You know, yeah, it seems like they have plenty of coin. The Pharisees, you know, they're, they're <laughs> top of the heap and everybody's supposed to bow down to them. So yeah, I, I agree with you. They, uh, they think the monetary, the Roman monetary system is fine, but they preach against it. As I understand, the Herodians thought maybe using the coins were, uh, was all right, was using the monetary system, but the, the hypocrite, that's why Jesus called them hypocrites, because they, they produce a coin, but they, they preach that uh, we shouldn't use them the way I understand it. Yeah, I agree with you. I thought that was very Did good. they not think that he was going to catch on? <laughs> I think so. A couple things that occur to me here are these. First of all, you're right on the coin. But on the other hand, it's the only money available. Right. So what are you going to do? Otherwise, you're going into a total barter situation. Or as Jesus done, be totally dependent upon the goodness of others to provide whatever is needed. Mm -hmm. So it's a tough choice in a sense, but it is a very powerfully religious violation because it is a specific violation of the first of the Ten Commandments. You shall have no images of any God, and especially any non-God, because on that coin would be the inscription of Caesar, which is saying, Son of God. He's not the Son of God, he's a mortal. And so this is a, an exaggeration here. So there is a violation of that commandment there. 
But the other thing that struck me too is they didn't care because their mission was to get Jesus. And that colored their actions. And so when they were obsessed with this, they basically are discrediting and putting themselves in sinful danger. And that's something that's very human to do this. Mm -hmm. Because when we get intense about something, our sense of balance and our desire for maintaining a moral life is kind of set aside. And we're going places that otherwise we probably wouldn't do. Think of the times any of us have lost our temper. And later we say, how did that happen? I can't believe I did this, but we know we did it. Mm -hmm. Because we lost you know, a sense of morality and control over our actions and our words. Right. That's, that seems to be an element in this. And Jesus simply called them out. He knew. No, he knew. Because this is a, a series of these things. He just simply says, this, I know why you're here. You're asking what you think is an honest question, but I know better. You know, this is a trap. And he saw through it and turned it on him. That's what made it there. But we have to watch ourselves this. And we have to face the reality that this is not a pure world. And that sometimes we're going to have to get in there and deal with the mess of the world as it is. But we have to keep our sense of direction and balance and integrity intact. Is that how possibly we could get into the second reading when we talk about uh, calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance in the hope of Jesus Christ? That we, we have to continually remind ourselves to do those types of things, to be able to not get, you know, over on the wrong side, going for the power and the wealth, all those things. But we really need to do, be there for the charity of others. Remember those things. I, I mean, that's how I would kind of interpret it. Yeah, I thought, I thought uh, along those lines, Jesus kind of one up them by saying, Turn your attention to repaying to God the, the deeds that are to Him. His, the God's do. He, he said, don't worry about this other seizure. Pay Him, but you better focus more on getting to heaven and, and following what God wants you to do. And I thought Jesus did a good job of, uh, of casting their attention in a higher direction. But He also says that in um, that it's not just you need to um, follow and be prepared. You need to make sure that you're, you know, staying with God and trying to, you know, obviously keep the structure. You want to do the right thing, but you need to also focus. I mean, that's what I'm getting from it. To go back to the letter of, to the Thessalonians that you mentioned originally, Rich, I think you have to keep in mind two things. One is, this is the very beginning of the letter. Right. And in fact, it's the first letter that Paul probably wrote to any church. The Thessalonians were his first church. And they're newbies. Yeah. They're very new Christians. And so they, they're feeling their way. And Paul is saying to them is, guys, keep your eyes on the faith that you have been given. Keep it intact and support each other. Because everybody's new at this, and for anybody to say, hey, I've got it all together, you'll soon find out you don't. And so you need to be supportive of each other. And that's why Paul wrote the letter, yeah. to encourage them to stay on the right track and reinforce them, because he's probably getting these communications back that things are getting a bit messy here. You know, they're kind of fumbling around. And, he's, and he writes the letter to say, Remember, remember, remember. You know, get back to where you should be. And I suspect they were probably being persecuted as well during that time, or not? I don't, I don't remember. Uh, probably harassed. Correct. Probably no formal, bloody type persecution, but people were probably questioning them and saying, "What are you doing? What is this stuff?" Yeah. And they may not have been too secure and you know, and you know, well informed enough to really answer those questions well. So he's Again, giving, they're new. Yeah, so he's giving them the words of encouragement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but it's not his words of encouragement so much. It's that the power of the Spirit 
He wants to go back there and say simply, you have to be in tune with the power of the Spirit. It's not human endeavor alone, because that's what happens so many times. We think we have to do this ourselves. Right. Well, we need to be make an effort, but it's not coming all from us. We have to realize that we are a Spirit-powered people, and that we have received the Spirit in baptism and confirmation, and certainly through the body and blood of Jesus Christ, we are reinforced with that divine power and presence then, too. Hmm. Yeah. Because Kathleen always said, who's in control, kid? <laughs> Who is in control? <laughs> the Almighty. Mm -hmm. It's taken me a long time to learn that. <laughs> We're not done to learn it ever. Yep. Ever. Yeah. Ever. Ever. It's down. a work in progress. But again, then you look at that first reading from Isaiah. And this is really quirky. Because first of all, Isaiah is a prophet of Israel. And he's announcing that Cyrus is doing God's work. Who is Cyrus? He is the king of the Persian Empire. Which was huge. Which was huge at that time. This is the big state in Asia. I mean, this place is huge. It goes from the Mediterranean Sea to India. It's covering a lot of turf and untold thousands of people. And the Hebrews are just a little speck on this map. And right now they're in Babylon in exile. And Cyrus is saying, go home. You go home. Go away. Because he probably doesn't want to bother with them. And, and Isaiah is saying, this is the hand of God. He made Cyrus your liberator. That you can not, we can now return home to our land from which we were forced to leave. And he said, God it. God is working through Cyrus. Well, that was news to Cyrus because he doesn't he know no this idea. guy. He's got his own gods, the Persian gods. Cyrus doesn't care about the Hebrews. They're kind of probably like a like a fly to him, like they would be, to, you know, as we would be a fly, just kind of brushing away, go away. Okay, but you know, so it's like it doesn't matter. But this, but what Isaiah is saying is, he's working through him. God is making him do this. Although he's not aware of it. And that's right. He's totally unaware of it. And this is the subtlety of God. And I was said in the reading, said that God called him by name. I called you by name. And that struck me. You know, we're all called by name at our baptism. So it, it kind of rang my attention, got my attention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's just like you look at that and say, Cyrus never realized that God was using him. It would not have occurred to him. Because he wouldn't have been at all tuned to the gods of Israel. Hmm. Well, with that, I kind of was also trying to tie the, that reading with the gospel a little bit too, and I wrote down: no matter how big or powerful the empire is, whether it be Roman or Persian, the last line says it all: "I'm the Lord; there is no other." Same way in the gospel, what's God belongs to God. So I was kind of in a funny way that I was kind of trying to equate those two as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes any sense, but uh, that's what spoke to me at least, mm -hmm. put it that way. The one thing that echoes through this reading is God is subtle and God is in control. Mm -hmm. He's making things happen that we don't even realize that he is doing. And we can look at the current events and begin to say, "Is <clears throat> how come? Why is this happening? Somehow it's in God's plan. Don't ask me how. Don't ask me why. Don't ask me why. Somehow it's in God's plan. God is doing similar things today in peculiar ways and in odd places. And somehow this is the act <clears throat> of God. And that takes us back to Thessalonians where it says, Endure in hope. Keep hope, because even in our darkest hours, God is still here, and God isn't going to go away, and God is somehow going to lead us through this. It isn't going to be easy. It's no free passage, but there is going to be a path through, and this is the hope that we have, and it is dri driven by, the, in this world, by the Holy Spirit, and we are part of it. 
not because we are gifted and talented on our own, but because we are being graced by God to carry out what God wants done. And if we can be receptive and open to those graces and impulses from God, God's will gets done. But you got to be able to have that open mind to do that and to accept. Right. And that goes back again into the gospel where they were operating off of their agenda with their goals in mind and set everything else aside. And boy, are we not ever tempted to do that like all the time. <laughs> 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 And one of the other things I, I wrote down too were, was in our own life, are we testing God? Are we the ones as well that are hypocritical like the uh, Herodians and like the Pharisees and things like that? Because sometimes we resort to those, I, those things in our daily life and it makes it very difficult. Um, sometimes you know, when you come to Mass and you know, you need to be able to either go to confession or uh, clear your mind, con examine your conscience to say, hey, am I in the right spot or am I falling into their camp? So. I think there's a reason we call God our Father. That's right. He's a parent. <laughs> and I think anybody who's been a parent, relate this with your experience of raising your children. They test you all the time. <laughs> All the time. Even when they're grown. Even when they're grown. <laughs> I can't speak from that experience myself except for my experience of being the tester. <laughs> but, I can. <laughs> but that's that's it there. And I think after given God's wisdom and endurance, shall we say, right. he probably just kind of laughs at it and says, oh, okay, you'll find out. We'll get through this one, too. God's got a perspective that goes far beyond ours. He's got a sense of humor, too. He's got to have one. Oh, yeah. He's got to have one. Okay. I couldn't help but notice the thing in the, in the gospel where the Pharisees, uh, the disciples, and they said, we know you're a truthful man. You always speak the truth. They were, they were mocking him. They don't, you know, they don't for a minute think he's the, you know, the way, the truth, and the life. They, they were mocking him, and I think Jesus said, uh, like I said, so straight. I thought that was pretty good. And, uh, you know, they said that Jesus does not regard a person's status. They hated Jesus because he did not bow down to their status. Yes. I mean, he, he <laughs> praised the lowly and the poor as higher than the Pharisees, and they did not like it. So for them to say, well, we know you don't uh, appreciate somebody's status, you're darn right. Uh, and they, that's why they hated him. One of the, one of the many reasons, I should say. And the other reason being is he was upsetting their established traditions and established art. He was a force of change that they didn't want. Perhaps that makes us uncomfortable too. No, oh, it certainly makes us uncomfortable. I know that. <laughs> As we come to Mass this weekend, I invite you to consider a couple of things. This deals with preparation and anticipation for Mass. Because it's really easy to look at the clock and say, oh my gosh, it's 10 minutes before Mass starts, let's pack, run, and get there. Well, you probably will arrive on time without any harm done. But are you really all there in church? Chances are no, because it was too much of a rush. And though the body arrived, the mind hasn't got out of the car or out of the house yet. So I invite you to take a look at how you prepare and anticipate Mass. And this all happens before you get even on the parking lot. When do you make the decision to come to church? Now for some people, there's really no decision involved. It's part of their weekend routine. You always come to 4 o'clock Mass or any other masses on Sunday morning. And it's like, they know exactly what they're gonna do. They're gonna walk into church, do their rituals, and end up in the same place every week. It's a routine. Is this good? Is it bad? No, really, it's neither. It's just a routine. The routine is what you make of it. Now, it gets you here, but are you really here? That's always gonna be the question. Because when routine becomes automatic, you know, the body knows how to make the moves, but where's the mind? 
Now, for those who choose week by week what mass they come to or if, then that's a different issue because it's like saying is, what's a value to me? Do I value this? Do I want this? This is something that speaks to my heart and my soul. And hopefully it does, but apparently not enough all the time. And so preparation there may be is to dig deep and see how I can enrich and entice myself to see this more valuable and make my life live it so. That's called making Mass a priority. And if we're a person of prayer, and that's where it all starts, Mass will become a priority. But the prayer has got to be something that happens, not just at one hour on Sunday morning, but part of our life on a much more regular basis. Because when we see it as just one option and a host of other options, which option is going to win this week, or most weeks, or what is going to happen? Decisions are a result of the way we rank our priorities. First things get done first. And we can talk the game, but reality says what the ranking really is. So when you're preparing and to make the decision to come, even those things make a difference too. When do you start getting ready for math? And to actually come here? A last minute thing or something that was thought out beforehand? I mean, you can look back on that and ask, how do you prepare? Come as you are, or dress for the occasion? How do you set up your schedule for that day? For instance, if somebody says, I'm coming to 10.30 Mass on Sunday. When you go, are you going to eat before Mass, or after, or both? How do you arrange that? Because if you're in church and you hadn't had breakfast yet at 10.30, and your stomach's growling, and you, I mean, that's going to be getting your attention, possibly more than Mass is. But, <laughs> or whatever time it happens to be. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody getting it over with. Yeah. yeah. In other words, hurry up, Father, I'm hungry. Yeah. I can feed you the body of Christ, but the rest are on your own. Yeah. Okay. But we have to, you know, these are preparations here. And do you give yourself enough time to get here comfortably so that it can be a spiritual ride rather than a journey on the road? So that you have time to tune in, settle in, and be there fully. Moving into a worshiping, prayerful mindset. It just doesn't happen because you want it. It has to be prepared and given space to develop. And that's why when we go into church, we want it to be a quiet and peaceful place. Because we want to leave the noise outside and come into this quiet zone where we can hear God speak to us in however quiet a way God speaks to us. We've tried to make a setting in church with the music that we played beforehand. And people have remarked that they find it very helpful. Mm -hmm. It gets you focused. It I mean, helps you just, get, yeah. right, get you focused, and it also cuts out the ten temptation to go over and say hi to your neighbor that you mm -hmm. haven't seen all week. There is a time to socialize, but this isn't the place. We want to set aside those distractions. We want to leave the worries out in the car. We want to give ourselves the space to simply sit and share time and love with God. Leaving God's space so that God can say to us, Rich, Kathleen, Steve, glad to see you this morning. Let me give you a hug. You know, those kind of things. But we have to think of Mass as a pilgrimage to come to a place that is holy and the journey is worth it. People talk about going on pilgrimages. You know, there's different places in the world where they do this. You know, the pilgrimages people make to Lourdes are Lady of Guadalupe Shrine, or some of those which are walking journeys, mm -hmm. or walking the ways of the cross in Jerusalem, for instance. Right. These kind of things. It's a whole mindset of work, and the experience makes the graces of it abundant and powerful. The point is to come here and to be open to the experience of being here, and that experience is to let God into our lives and change our lives and make our lives more like His own. Thank you for watching Mass Warm Up for this coming Sunday. We hope this enriches your experience of worship at Mass this weekend. We look forward to receiving your feedback on our presentation. 
Your comments and suggestions on mass warm-up help us improve what we do. We hope you will be with us next week as we present St. John the Beloved Disciple Parish's Sunday Mass Warm-Up. Come and join us for worship at St. John the Beloved Disciple Catholic Church. Weekend Mass times are Saturday at 4 p.m., Sunday morning at 7.30 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10.30 a.m. Let us close with the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, and to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen.